Welcome everyone to our doc virtual Doctors Night Out with Dr. Kelly Ann. Thank you all for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kelly Ann. Hello everyone. Good evening. I'm Dr. Kelly Ann Petrucci. I'm the host of Virtual Doctors Night Out. I'm really proud to bring to you tonight some of the best experts out there. We're here to inform you. This is a global conversation. We're giving you answers that you've been looking for and we're doing it in a way that you probably haven't heard of before. That's what this forum is about. Any doctor that you see on Doctors Night Out, these are doctors that I know, love, and trust. These are doctors that are committed to integrity, growth, and authenticity. Most of these doctors I've even broke bread with. These are doctors I truly do hold close to my heart. But most importantly, I promise you, these doctors and these practitioners and these experts, they are the true truth seekers. Welcome, panel. Great to see everyone Thank tonight. You. Great to see everyone smiling Thank face. You. So I get a couple, so I need to brag a little bit. And you know, we go through the bios, and a lot of times when you go through bios, when we do these kind of things, you know, this is when we get the eye roll. But I want you to really listen because these are people that really are at the top of their game and i'm super proud to have them on let's start with mm -hmm. bo easton Bo, hi hey. so glad that you're here and nice i have to tell you bo was one of my coaches so when i was out there in the world and i was looking for ways that i can really uh, well i've learned so much since from bo uh, how i can really captivate and make people not look away this man has so much to do with that he's an expert in what he does He's a former NFL All-Pro. He's an actor, a playwright, a speaker, a leadership trainer, and a national best-selling author. He's achieved the highest status in all of those areas. Bo Easton started his career in the NFL as a top pick for the Houston Oilers, continuing on to the San Francisco 49ers during his fifth year career. After football career ended, he branched out into acting and wrote a one-man play Unbelievable. He wrote a one-man play called Runt of the Litter that went to Broadway. Now, as a speaker and a leadership coach, he trains some of the most successful people in the world, athletes, artists, entrepreneurs, C-suite execs, on how to communicate for maximum impact, impact and success. His book, There's No Plan B for Your A-Game. By the way, I've read this over and over, and I've read little captions of it. Let me read it again. It's, there's no plan B for your A game. Pick that up. Be the best in the world at what you do is a national bestseller. It debuted on USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Publishers Weekly, all the stuff, all the stuff. So I'm so happy to have you here, and we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. Dr. Elizabeth Lombardo. <coughs> Dr. Elizabeth Lombardo is quite possibly one of the most positive people that I know. Whenever I need inspiration, where does my text end up? To Elizabeth Lombardo. <laughs> Dr. Elizabeth Lombardo is an authority on how to crush your inner critic so that you can live a life of purpose, fulfillment, and true success. She's America's most trusted celebrity psychologist with over 100 national media interviews. She really truly is a media darling. She's been interviewed on the Today Show, Good Morning America, Dr. Oz, Fox Business News, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and countless others. She is incredible on air. Considered to be Shaquille O'Neal's head coach for happiness, Dr. Elizabeth Lombardo is on a mission to help you recognize your real self-worth, and don't we need that, so you can live life that you've always dreamed of. Dr. E, as we call her, Dr. E is on a mission to change the global conversation around your inner critic. That's inner critic syndrome, as she calls it, for good so we can live happier, fuller, and more connected lives. Welcome, so happy you're here. Oh, good to be here, thank you. Yeah. Trisha Nelson, so Trisha Nelson, I have to, you know, a little, um, a little scoop on her. When I was first going to Los Angeles and I was staying in hotels and so forth, a mutual friend said, why aren't you staying with Trisha Nelson? She has a beautiful home and she, she is the nicest person. I said, well, I really don't do that. I don't do staying with people, I'll just stay in a hotel. So I actually, and Melissa's laughing because she heard this story, I reluctantly said, okay, okay, because this friend said, we met, we went to dinner, the very first minute I, I kind of walked in the door, and it was so obvious why people are so effusive about this woman. She just opened her house up and continues to do so. She is the most lovely person, but what I want you to know about Trisha is that I left there 
after staying with her. And I felt truly inspired by what this woman is able to do with her day, the construct of her day. And there's something to learn there. And we're all going to find out. So Tricia Nelson is an internationally acclaimed author, transform, uh, transformative speaker, and emotional eating expert. You hear that, everyone? Emotional eating expert. She's been featured on dozens of health and television networks, including Fox, NBC, CBS, KTLA, and Discovery Health. Tricia has successfully helped hundreds of people overcome a variety of eating disorders and addictions. Tricia has spent the last three decades studying the addictive personality and she shares her finding in workshops and retreats of both in person and online. Many doctors, psychologists, and other health practitioners benefit from her insight about what drives people to overeat and stop. Trisha's new book, Heal Your Hunger. I love that brand. Is that not the best name for a brand? <laughs> Trisha's book, Heal Your Hunger, Seven S Simple Steps to End Emotional Eating Now is available everywhere through Amazon. Welcome, Tricia. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Joan Rosenberg. Joan Rosenberg can always count on Joan Rosenberg. If you only know what I've been through with these people, what I have been through, her showing up, picking, I, I won't even get into it. These are phenomenal, phenomenal, through to the core people. Uh, Joan Rosenberg is a best-selling author, consultant, and master clinician. It's actually Dr. Rosenberg. It's Dr. Joan Rosenberg is a cutting edge psychologist who is known as an innovative thinker, acclaimed speaker and trainer. As a two time TEDx speaker, you have to check out her TEDx talk. It's unbelievable. Lots of, lots of uh, kudos for that. And member of the Association of Transformational Leaders. She's been recognized for her thought leadership and influence in personal development. A California licensed psychologist, Dr. Rosenberg speaks on how to build confidence emotional strength and resilience. She's a professor of graduate psychology at Pepperdine University in Los Angeles and her latest book, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love, How to Master Your Difficult Feelings to Cultivate Lasting Confidence, Resilience and Authenticity was released in February, 2019. Welcome Dr. Rosenberg. Thank you so much. Melissa Catherine. Thank you. So my, my soul sister, Melissa Catherine. Oh my gosh. So, you know, she's, she's my twin, just so you know, she's my twin and she's, uh, she's so good at what she does. All of these people, I mean, they're just so passionate about what, what, what they do. And all of these people, all they do is grow and grow and grow and so committed to growth. And Melissa, you've been such an inspiration to me. I'm so happy you're here. She's a certified holistic nutritionist, emotional eating and trauma healer hypnotherapist, body intuitive, and boy is she ever. She can read me like a book. International best-selling author and speaker, Melissa is dedicated to freeing women from all limiting beliefs, emotional eating, and self-sabotaging cycles. How many of us do this? How many of us self-sabotage? We're gonna learn a lot about that tonight. She helps them to make peace with food themselves and their own body. And you certainly have done that for me. Her sole mission is to bring women back to the truth of who they were before they thought they were less than. How beautiful. Due to a number, uh, due, instead of a number on a scale or any trauma that occurred in their lives, she comes through and she 180s all of that. Welcome, Melissa Catherine. I'm so happy you're here. Okay, so guys, let's talk. Because, you know, we've been pretty heavy in all of these uh, sessions thus far because this is a heavy topic and it's a heavy time. But, you know, the calls that I'm getting are from people saying, I am going head first into a jar of Nutella every day and I can't stop myself. And we all know it's not the right thing to do, but I think what we really need to do, and, and I am seeing it in a lot of other people, and I have to tell you, when this first started, when I was first trying to cognitively figure everything out, I had a lot of those thought patterns and those pathways I had to go through and break. But there are strategies and there are tactics. And so let's really bang this out with people and help them get through this time because what we don't want to be is on the other side of this and not like who we've become, right? We want to... We want to come out of the other side of this even better because we can. So, Bo, I'm going to start with you. Bo, in a crisis like this, you know, it's so easy, as we just said, to feel kind of overwhelmed, to feel helpless. And we're going to turn to food for comfort. That's what we've kind of been designed to do or we've been trained to do. But you have a message, and it really resonated with me. You said that 
we are far from being helpless. Actually, we're uniquely equipped for demanding situations just like this, more than any other animals on the planet. So what you're saying is we, we are already ready to deal with this. So many of us don't feel that. Explain what you mean. Yeah, I mean, I think throughout this whole pandemic, the whole thing, it's the thing that people need to be reminded of is actually who we are. And who we are, are are the greatest species in the, not only on the planet, but in the history of the planet when it comes to adaptation. When it comes to demanding situations, we adapt. Our ancestors adapted, they competed. And that's what, that's how the only reason we're here and the dinosaurs aren't here. We're here because we know how to adapt and we know how to adapt quickly. And this is no different right now. Right now, we got to take this opportunity. It's like a gift, if you think about it. It's like an opportunity to go, hey, here's a demanding situation. You want to get better at something? You want to evolve? You want to adapt and improve the species? Okay, somebody just handed it to us. Here we go. We got to adapt to this situation. The thing we got to remember is, we're, like we get, people get fearful and they get afraid and they, they eat and they do whatever they're going to do, right? Because they forget who they are. Be, you know why we forget who we are? Because we're watching the news for like eight hours a day and the news is not talking to us how we truly are. They're talking to who we're not. They're talking to who we're not which is fearful little species that have somehow survived on this earth for all these millions of years. When in reality, if they talked, if they spoke to who we actually are, which is the greatest species at adaptation in the history of the planet, they would know and we would know exactly what to do. And that is take this demanding situation and adapt to it and come out the other end better, more evolved. Because look, you know, my, my history in athletics is it, and, and to be the best athlete on the planet, guess what you have to do? You have to adapt faster than every other human being on the planet. That's how it goes. And now you and me get this gift of adaptation of a demanding situation. I say, let's take a hold of it and get better while we just been handed this gift. Is it kind of, is it like uh, working out, you know, and you, they, they say muscle memory? Is there some kind of, is there some kind of, what runs through our body that allows us to say, okay, and how can we get people to shift? Because I love what you're saying about this, about this adaptation, but yeah. how do you make that shift to say, I am not going to be a victim in this. I'm going to shift this and, and, and adapt. What is it that has to transpire for that to happen? Yeah, there, so adaptation can't happen. It can't happen, it's impossible, inside of a comfort zone. So if you are inside of your current capacity and you're trying to batten down the hatches and stay safe, right, and stay comfortable, then you, it's impossible to adapt and evolve. You can't get better. So if, if, for example, if you see an athlete who remains the same and tries to keep the status quo, and they go up against other great athletes who aren't interested in that comfort zone, they're actually interested in, in struggle, because struggle is a biological necessity to getting better. And our dream, and it should be all humans' dream, is to get better instead of staying comfortable. So struggle's a part of that. And I, I love that. You know, I, it's, it's hard to get because of the struggle, because human beings just don't like struggle. But I got to do, I have three kids and every day I've got to address this with them. They say to me, dad, it's hard to be the best athlete. It's hard to be the best ballet dancer. It's hard to be the best pastry chef. And I say, of course it is because you're beyond your comfort zone. That's, it's a biological necessity that you be beyond your own uh, abilities right now. That's the only way you're gonna get better. And our bodies, you have to trust because look, our ancestors were great at this. We're actually, we're, we're amazing at this. We just mm. forgot that we're amazing at this. We've mm. gotta allow our be. bodies to adapt. And I, and I think you're right. And I think 
one of the ways that we can really think about this adaptation and adapting is sometimes you just have to change your physiology. We have to just really go from that closed chain and get our body up and breathe like you always talk about. There's a certain physiology and psychology that's got to kind of flip in there. Dr. Lombardo, you talk about the red zone. What do you mean by this red zone and how can that help us through the situation? Yeah, so so if you think of stress as um, being on a continuum, right? It's not like I'm stressed or I'm not stressed. It's a continuum from zero to 10. So zero stress is uh, when the spas were open, you were just off the massage table and life is great. <laughs> 10 out of 10 is overwhelmed with stress, like proverbial steam coming out of your ears. Now, when we were at lower levels of stress, a one, a two, a three, I call it the green zone. And when we're in the green zone, we're using more of our frontal lobe, right? The structure that Bo was talking about that differentiates us from other animals. And when we're in the green zone, we can see all different perspectives. Right? We can engage in things like executive functioning, problem solving. We're really smart when we're in the, with this green zone. As we get higher up on the stress scale, our focus changes. And it changes for a biological reason, because instead of using more of the frontal lobe, that limbic system, that fight or flight, that emotional reasoning creeps in. So that when we're in the red zone, which I call from a seven out of 10 or higher, we're focusing on what's wrong. We're focusing on, 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 on what people are doing that we personalize. So when we're in the green zone and we're in quarantine and our family does something, they're like, ah, it's just my partner. It's just my kid. When we're in the red zone, we want to strangle them, right? So when we're in the red zone, we aren't we aren't using all of our rational thinking because that limbic system is kind of taking over. I always tell my coaching clients, if you're in the red zone, don't let anything out of your mouth because that's when we say things we later regret. It's and don't role. let anything in your mouth because that's when we consume things we later regret. Look, when we're in the green zone, we can all say, oh yes, bone broth would be a lovely thing to consume right now and a fresh, healthy salad. But when we're in the red zone, we go right for the comfort food, the food that we know <laughs> in the green zone we don't wanna eat, but in the red zone, we just go for that. So one of the keys to emotional eating is to address your stress and get yourself out of that red zone. So instead of you know using that limbic system, that fight or flight, that emotional reasoning, you can go back into your rational thinking and say, you know what? I don't need to eat the entire plate of cookies right now. One will do just fine. Dr. Rosenberg, do you think that uh, you talk about choosing attitudes that bolster resilience? Because I'm hearing a lot, when, when I hear these experts speaking, I can't help but to go and think so many of this is attitude. You know, even with people on my team and things like that, people that have been on my teams throughout the years, and, and I always can tell when someone is going to succeed by attitude. So talk to me about attitudes and how they bolster your resilience through this process. Well, let, let me build on, on what Bo said as a way to do that, because Bo's talking about a, a willingness and a choice into struggle and a choice beyond your comfort zone. So under, understand someone is making a decision to do that, right? So, so I, if, I'm, if I'm, and one of the things that, that I've talked about during this time is that we can, we can look at the, especially, so, so let me contextualize it, especially if we have uh, shelter, food, friends, yes. financial yes. resources, right? And, and the community around us, then, then, we're, community. Re then, then we're resourced, right? Mm -hmm. Then, then mm -hmm. let's, let's bring the fear and anxiety down and understand then that this can be a time where I can start to ask questions like, how can I, how can I use this time to bring the best out of me, right? Or, or any, any question that's like that. How do I want to use this to grow? Or how do I want to use this to push me out of the comfort zone and be better than I was before? So, so we can, the, the idea that I would build on with Bo is that we're making decisions about that. And then we're choosing the attitudes to carry us through, right? So a willingness to to persevere, that I'm going to persevere no matter what. It's a resilient attitude. Um, a willingness to ask help, ask for help. That's a, res that's a resilience attitude. I'm going to lean on others. I think success a lot of times people away. think, Dr. Rosenberg, a lot of times people think of this as a weakness. And I really want to point out that what you're saying, is, it's quite the opposite. So people have to really flip that in their mind. And I want them to be aware of that right now. 
uh, myself included in, in my younger years, you, you tend to think, and I don't know if that's uh, internal programming, if it's programming that we have as a young, but, but we think that's weak, but it's not at all. It's not at all. It's, in fact, I look at, at uh, asking for help, the willingness to ask for help as one of the key elements of, of emotional strength. Oh. So, so, I, so it, 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 hands down, uh, it, it's one of the key elements of emotional strength. And Bo and I have had many conversations around this. None of us succeed alone. There's, there's, there's people around us that help each of us succeed. So, so again, asking for help then and, and allowing others to support us when, we're, when we experience our own needs and limitations is a resilient, it's a resilient action or a resilient attitude. Right. I, I um, can certainly agree with that. And I've certainly lived that truth with everyone on the panel that's helped me in some certain way uh, has been a big force for me. Uh, let's talk about cravings a little bit, because a lot of people are saying, you know, they, they feel like they have their cravings are through the roof. And I want to address that. So, Melissa, Catherine, you talk a lot about uh, head versus heart cravings. Tell us what you mean by that and how can that help direct us a little bit more? Yeah, well, I found there's two types of cravings, really trying to break it down to help people to identify with what's going on with them. And heart cravings, so basically heart cravings are coming from a void within yourself. Generally, when we have a heart craving, we will crave foods that are creamy, that are sweet, that are more decadent by nature. They will have it will be ice cream. It will be foods that will have a memory of deep comfort and love, a resonance within our system. And it will, if you check in with yourself, and I'll take you guys through the prompts and the questions, but when you check in with yourself, it's, it really stems from something within you where there's a lack or a void, where there's a gap within, maybe you don't feel on purpose, it's your career, there's a lack in your relationship, or a lack of love within yourself. Mm -hmm. And those cravings, you will really see them show up. It's really that eight o'clock witching hour. It's when you're going for these cakes and cookies and ice cream and things of that nature. Then there's the head craving. Head craving really most more comes from stress. It's feeling a lack of control. Prime example, I was speaking with a client earlier and she was saying, you know, I had salmon, I had asparagus for dinner. And then Melissa, I was on our group call and I'm, and I'm going for potato chips. And we were going into it and what she was really finding was her husband is overseas right now and can't come back and she's feeling a lack of control with that so she was wanting to crunch and the foods that we'll crave at that time will be granola chips popcorn cereal things of that nature that we can crunch on and my question for that is always you know what is it that you want to chew on in life and the number one way to get around that is what is one action step you can do to regain control in that moment? Because that's really what we're feeling. All of these emotional desires that we're having within food is because there's a lack of certainty right now. Certainty is one of you know, the five human needs. It's something that we thrive on. So when there's a lack of control, especially if you've been a dieter, you thrive on a plan and having a plan that you can follow because you actually don't trust your body and you don't trust your food choices. So the, that's where those cravings really come from. And so I generally will tell people, it's just four simple questions. If you can in that moment, any change really starts with awareness. So if you can in that moment, just ask yourself, am I really hungry right now? You're, right, you're reaching for something, you're standing in front of the fridge, all that time that we open up the fridge and we're just standing there staring, there's not real hunger. When you're really hungry, you're eating, like you're ready to pull something out or you're standing there going, I don't know, what do I want? You're not actually hungry, you're wanting to do something, you're wanting to feel something, you're wanting to experience something, you're wanting a reprieve from something that's occurring in your world. And so I just generally ask you know, the four questions, am I really hungry right now? What's going on in my life right now? So say the answer is no, I'm not really hungry. What's going on in my life right now? Well, my kids are in the other room, I haven't had a break, I'm confined to my house, I can't get outside, I don't know what's going on in the world, I'm stressed about money, right? Like, and then it's like, okay, so is food gonna help you or hurt you? Is food gonna support what you're needing, right? And then what can you do instead? Because what we really find out is what we're needing to do is pause and get in touch with what we're actually needing, what we're desiring to feel and experience. And mm. so often if you've been emotionally eating, food has become a human connection. It's no longer a substance. It's actually Did everyone serving. hear that? I, I, I want to stop you for one moment. 
Melissa, hang on. I want everyone to hear what she just said, because this is really important. Food becomes your connection, right? Your emotional connection. It's a, it becomes, I really try to help people to understand because they go, why am I sabotaging? Don't I need more willpower? Don't I need, need more discipline? And when you can start to look at your relationship with food, it is your mode of survival, not from a food source, but where there is lack, you will fill those gaps with food. And all of that lack within yourself, within your life, anything is being illuminated with this pandemic right now. Anything that has gone unhealed, unaddressed, any dreams, any desires that you have, anything that you, your relationship isn't working or it is working, the things that are working are being illuminated and the things that aren't are really being illuminated and you have nowhere to go but look at them. Oh boy, is that the truth? So, you know, one of the things, I love that. And, and one of the things, Trisha, that I want to bring up with you is that I, I think that your life habits that I, you know, I learned so much from you, as I said, and I think you, you talk about how you start your day making sure your tank is full. And I really think if you couple that with what we're learning here, I think that that's a good way to kind of navigate your way through what you may feel during the day. Because, you know, my perspective, I feel like we have a lot of stress hormones running through our bodies. It's norepinephrine, uh, you know, cortisol, all of these things. Uh, the, these stress hormones, they're actually made of sugar and fat. They're actually derived from that. So in order for us to feed these stress hormones, in order for these stress hormones to survive, guess what they're going to do? They're going to tap you and say, feed me, feed me, feed me. So I think you have to have something within you that is going to quell the stress from the very get-go. So talk to me about your day because it's really, it's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. You've seen it front and center, haven't you? Um, Hi, so, and thank you so much for, it's really a pleasure to be here and such an honor among all these amazing guests. Um, you know, for me, I, I've, I've been 50 pounds overweight and really just an all out food addict. And uh, what I learned in order to not live that lifestyle anymore, I had to draw on something else. You know, I mean, I had to be fueled in some other way. I mean, food was my go-to for everything, you know, happy, sad, mad, you know, upset, anything. It was just such a habitual uh, thing. And so what I learned to do and was taught to do and was really to, like you said, fill your tank first thing in the morning. So I start my day um, literally in prayer. I start with prayer. This is my first connection, first thing. And then meditation. And these two things are so, so vital for me. Um, I also, the prayer thing, um, I actually like to, these are all what I call, I have uh, six self-care success secrets that really get me set up for success. And this is what I teach my clients as well. Um, and and I de what the purpose of all these things are, and I'll just name them, it, it's prayer, it's meditation, it's reading something inspirational or spiritual. Um, it's also having connection, talking uh, to friends, talking to people that uh, can support you, walking um, as well. Um, and of course, I'm going to miss one <laughs> on the spot. But um, so uh, prayer, uh, reading, talking, meditation, walking and, and there's another one in there but the, and the point is all these things i don't do all of them first thing in the morning but the point is they i do them because i need to fill my tank and i can draw on that that can fuel me throughout the day because if i just pop out of bed and i am just you know going through my day doing 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 because overeaters are overdoers you know really good at being in do mode and so when I'm doing that, I am just completely disconnected from myself, from my emotions, like Melissa Catherine was talking about. And, and what happens is later in the day, I'm on empty. I'm completely on empty. You know, I started on empty and I'm even more on empty at the end of the day. And I'm looking for the chips. I'm looking for the chocolate. I'm looking for things like quick energy, you know, get me something, you know, fast. And that's how we get in that mode. And my experience is about 75% of emotional eaters do most of their eating and overeating and binging after four o'clock in the afternoon. And so it's really important that we start our day really filling up our tank. And then we can draw on that later in the day when we've got that afternoon slump, when we've got that, you know, out of energy feeling. And 
we have spent the morning time having just some kind of centering routine, prayer and meditation, or, you know, somebody could read from the Bible or, you know, go for a walk and just have a, a, a quiet meditative walk, not an exercise pound my body walk, just a really a nice time just connecting with your inner spirit, you know, whatever fuels you. And, and my experience is I cannot do without it. Like if I'm off of that plan, you know, it's not, it's not good. <laughs> and so I've I never seen her off. I've never seen you off of that plan. She is regimented seven o'clock pitter patter, pitter patter. Okay. Um, seven, <laughs> bam. I mean, she is like, it's, it's methodical, methodical. And she's bubbly, she's very bubbly and vibrant. So if you want a well, good thank you. for that, she really, she truly I is. I, I, want get to, I want to, I want to get to Bo really quick because I think this will kind of seal everything we're talking. And that is you talk about your life story and creating this, this life story and I, I, your own life story. And I want to know more about this because I think this, that really spoke to me. Yeah. Well, the story, you know, is really, to me is the key to the kingdom. And I'll give you a couple of, of examples through history of how powerful stories are, right? Because us human beings, like us living in this situation that we're in right now, are tending to write a bad story about ourselves. And then we live that story out into existence. And that story, like for tonight's purposes, might be overeating or whatever it is, we're living that out. So let's think about a couple of stories. Like I always think of the Declaration of Independence as a story. Right. So that's that was written 250 years ago. And yet every every person, every American, at least in 250 years has made that story come to life every day by the way we live, by the way we walk around free, by the way we speak freely, by the way we can have this conversation that we're having now. We live out a story that we didn't even write. Our forefathers wrote that. That's how powerful story is. Another one, JFK um, said, made a speech and said, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely to earth by the end of the decade. And the only reason he said it is because the Russians were kicking our ass, right? They were ahead of us. And he's a competitive dude, right? So he says, they're not going to beat us. We're going to beat them. Well, imagine all those dudes and all those gals in NASA when he said that, when he announced it on TV, we're going to put a man on the moon, return him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. Can you imagine those people at NASA looking at each other going, what the hell did he just say? What yes. did he say we're going to do? Because he can say it. He wrote a story about it. We have to bring it into existence. And what did we do? JFK was assassinated. That's how powerful story is. He's dead the story still comes true by the end of the decade because we love story and you and me bring story into existence by the way we live. So let's write the right story right now. You know, like we could write a really bad one and no one could accuse us of being a victim. Could they? If we go, no. well, I'm just going to overeat and gain 18 pounds. <laughs> and then by the time the world goes forward, I'll just be fat. And I'll just be, you know, hoping that we can be under this, um, under this order where we have to stay in our house for another month until I get into shape. Well, let's begin <laughs> that story now, right? And start living this thing into existence now. Because I just got a feeling that people aren't sure if this world is going to go forward. And I can promise you, this sucker's going forward. It is going to hit, we're going to hit the go button and it is all systems go. Just like 9-11, just like the last earthquake, the last tornado, the last war we had, we hit the go button because we're great at that. And we're going to hit it again. So let's start telling the right story and live that one into existence. I truly well, I, believe that with all my heart. Go ahead, Trisha. I gotta, Oh, no, it's actually thanks. Stacey. I apologize. It just, this actually leads into a question I got at the very start of the, of the meeting in regards to sleeping at night. And maybe it is that we need to tell the right story. So I thought I would just put this out to the panel. Um, in regards to sleeping at night, they're going to bed and their head is just racing. And I'm sure this one individual asked the question, but I'm sure there's several people here um, thinking the same thing, including I. I'll raise my hand. Um, and so... 
I think also when you don't sleep, you don't eat well. So I think that stems, you know, together. Okay. So let me repeat the question. The, re the question is, panel, I cannot sleep at night. My, I, my mind is racing all night long. Dr. Lombardo, why don't you feel that one, start to feel that one for us? Because I know that you, um, you talk a lot about how we talk to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a sleep Nazi too. So <laughs> everyone in my house must go to sleep. Um, so yeah, what are you fueling your brain? And a lot of times we have so much going on in our minds. We're busy during the day. We don't have to process it. Head hits the pillow. Boom. That's when we have this opportunity to process it. So a couple of things that I recommend with my clients, one, um, turn off the news, just turn it off. Like if you must listen to the news once a day before all this happened, research showed that if you watch just three minutes of news in the morning, it increases your chance of having a bad day by 27%. Now people are watching, you know, hours after hours. Stop that, first of all. Second of all, journaling can be really a great thing to do. So journal, write out, you, you know, whatever's going on in your mind, kind of do a brain dump so it no longer has to process in here. Third, get off screens, not just the news, but any kind of screens. Develop a nighttime ritual Remember Pavlov's dog, right? We got, the, we got the bell, we got the food, we got the salvation, right? That's what happens. You take the food away, he still salvates. Why? Because he associated classical conditioning. So develop a nighttime routine, whether it's taking a warm shower, dimming the light, spending some time with your partner, reading a book, where your body's like, oh, it's now time for me to sleep. And then the one that I tend to use a lot when my mind is racing is I will listen to a relaxation or a, a self-hypnosis because what it does is it allows me to relax and I no longer have to think myself because I'm focusing on someone else's, someone else's words. Mm. Dr. Rosenberg, you talk a lot about moving emotions through your body and, you know, dealing with emotions. That's what your book talks a lot about. So let, let me ask you this. So they're talking about how their mind is racing. They can't sleep at night. Let's just talk about the anxiety that's precipitous to that. What about someone that's got a lot of anxiety, which of course, then you have the sleep issues. And then of course you're eating more. I mean, it goes one of two ways. When you're really anxious, you ain't eating anything or you're eating everything. So let's talk about a little bit about anxiety. That is a premier problem that my phone is ringing off the hook. Dr. Kelly Ann, I am sad. Dr. Kelly Ann, I am depressed. Dr. Kelly Ann, I feel such anxiety. Dr. Rosenberg, what do we say? <laughs> I say, the first thing I say is let's recast anxiety to something else. That's the first thing I say. Um, is this a time legitimately that we feel fearful? Yes, it is. Um, we have this insidious uh, and invisible uh, virus. We don't really, we haven't made full sense of it yet. And who knows when it's going to catch it, all that kind of stuff. Doesn't make sense that we feel kind of fearful or anxious. Yes, it does. Um, but I, so part of it is, I like to use language in, uh, as a way to kind of help us. Language and attitude. So I'll, I'll, I may come back to the attitude piece again. But the, so the part of the, for me, is understanding that, that, again, very quickly, fear is danger in the moment right now. If you have all sorts of resources around you and you're okay, then drop the word fear because it's just going to activate that state within your body. Uh, and so, so see if you can just stop using that language even. Does anxiety fit? Yes. It's, it's being worried about some bad event happening in the future. That's the way psychology talks about it. But, but the, again, if I asked 10 people what that meant to them, what anxiety meant, I'd get 10 answers. So the, first, the thing that I want people to consider right now is you're feeling more vulnerable. This idea that you could get hurt. And just understanding that can be calming in a weird sort of way. It's like, oh, wait, anxiety's out here. I can't do anything with it. Oh, but my, I, I, I'm actually concerned about being hurt. It settles the system down a little bit. Or it can. Does. And, and what's interesting to me, and, it, and I'm going to make a very fine distinction here for people. So, so you got that I hope that you can wrap your heads around this. So not only are we legitimately more vulnerable, most of us try not to be aware of that on a day-to-day -day basis, which is probably generally fairly healthy. But now we're experiencing that vulnerability. So now we have the sense of being vulnerable. So we are vulnerable because of the, the, the economic downturn and the disease process. We're feeling that vulnerability, which we normally don't feel. And the other thing that's changed, Kellyanne, 
is our awareness of our vulnerability. So now we're aware of it. Not only do we not typically feel it, now we're feeling it and we're aware of it. And if I take it one step further, and this is a little bit of the nerd in me, it's that what's, what has also changed is the degree to which we are aware that we are vulnerable. And that's big. Right? So, so it's, big. it's not just that we're feeling it differently. So anytime a tragedy or a trauma occurs, our head immediately goes to, how does that relate to me? And now we're aware of vulnerability in a way that we weren't aware of it. It happens anytime a shooting occurs, happen at, you know, bad, bad events. You found out somebody, somebody's now suffering from an illness. Doesn't matter what it is, it triggers us. And, it, and, and so what happens in those moments is that we're more aware of vulnerability. So one of the things I would say to the person, and along with all the suggestions that, that Dr. Lombardo just made, and they're great suggestions, uh, I, then what I would add is be aware that you're feeling more vulnerable. But what you have to do is you have to be in control of your mind. You have to be in charge. So a very personal story here, at the, at the first week that we were sheltering, I, I and to, also to Dr. Lombardo's point, don't, don't contain news. Really contain your, your attention to it. And I watched something that was really disturbing. And I'm a decent sleeper and I couldn't sleep. So three or four times up, I was up during the night and I recognized the hard time I was having. Five o'clock in the morning, I reached out to friends. Mm. But I, before I went back, before I went back, so I asked for help, right? And before I went back to sleep, it's like, it's like I, I deal with mindset. And so it's like, it's like, Joan, get hold of yourself here. You've got, to, you've got to be in charge of your mind. Your mind doesn't get to be in charge of you. So, That's a really so important and, point. I think we need to be very cognizant of what she just said. Be in control of your mind. We can do that, right? I mean, we can. We, we, have we absolutely time. can do that. So, so what I did, and it was very simple. I, 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 again, I, I did what I did earlier. It's like, if I'm rel I reminded myself, I had resources around me. And not only did I have resources around me, like food, shelter, all that kind of stuff, I knew that I could be resourceful, right? right? I could do the things I needed to do to get help I needed. So, it, so I reminded myself of the resources I had around me. I reminded myself of my resourcefulness. So the non-sleepers pay attention to this. And, and then I was saying to myself, look, you to always talk about being, staying focused on being positive, on being calm. And, and so I started to shift my mind over to that. It's like, mm. no, I'm not going to focus on the negative. I've got to be in charge of redirecting my own mind to stay in the right direction. And at and that, that point, really, uh, I felt like, I want to piggyback yeah, on that. Um, um, yeah, well, just do. something that helps please. me when when my mind is racing, um, because I find that overeaters are also overthinkers. And, you know, when I, when my mind, first of all, don't watch Breaking Bad before you go to bed. So I just learned that. But, um, but my experience is when my head, is, <laughs> when my head is racing, um, what helps me is to put pen to paper. That was my sixth right, self-care right. self secret. And I just dump everything on paper like or on your computer and I just let her rip and I just let all those crazy thoughts out all the awfulizing all the terrible things that might happen I just dump it all on paper and eventually I'm out of stuff you know and I'm, I'm kind of out of like oomph either so it doesn't have the same charge anymore when I dump it on paper and the other I thing like that too, getting rid of awfulization so write that down yeah. so getting rid of Melissa Catherine you talk about taking that first action step yeah. you talk about taking that first so how do we hearing all this how do we make that jump so um i like i'm still like going on the sleep thing i'm like also for anybody wait i'll just say this really quick anybody that's sure, getting over thinking, um one thing that i was noticing i was having a lot of anxiety is if you can get into a breath and actually get out of your head and calm the body 
a simple breath work that I can just share is just going in five breaths through the nose, suspend your breath for five, which allows your nervous system to calm. So your conscious mind can calm down and get out of that space of taking hold and then exhale out through the mouth and do that in a succession of five to 10 breaths before you get to bed to calm and relax. That can do wonders because your body in that moment isn't feeling safe. And if you can place a hand on your heart and a hand on your womb and actually just press in to do that connection, to remind yourself I'm in the body, I am not of the mind, I'm in the body. Because your body has all the answers. There is not a question that you have. There is nothing that your soul doesn't have an answer to. So we can always access that if we go in. To, um, so that was just the sleep thing. I was oh, like, wait, just before doing... you go on, Melissa, Catherine, yeah. before you go on, can you take us through that breath? One, just one breath, just so everybody oh, yeah, knows how to do this at home. So everybody, yeah. I want you to get in position for this. So, uh, so you want both feet on the floor, sitting upright, I would assume. Feet on the floor. I do say connect in to close your eyes because we don't want to be connected to anything LED. All This is a lot of stimulation. We don't recognize how much stimulation this is and how much energy is coming through all the social medias and all the things that we, all the interwebs that we're doing. So you just want to close your eyes, come into a calm space, palms up. And I want you to breathe deep in through the nose and just follow what I'm doing. Just breathe in through the nose and listen to my words. Coming in through the belly, filling up your belly, filling up your chest, your diaphragm. Breathing in as much air as you can. As if like, if you have a coffee straw, you can't take in anymore. And then I want you to suspend that breath for five, four, three, two, and one. And exhale out through the mouth, completely emptying your body, relaxing and releasing and letting go of all fears, worries, doubts, and anxiety. And on an inhale, we can bring in white healing light into the body that's calming, relaxing the body. Three, two, one. Suspend the breath again, going to the still quiet place in the mind. Letting go of all thoughts, worries, fears, and doubts. Two, one. Exhale out through the mouth, slowly, five, four, three, two, one. And when you do that, and then afterwards, we just go in and just, it's really calming in the process to just connect in because when we're up in, in our heads, we forget that we are of the body. Your body never lies. Your body will always connect you to your truth. It's the mind that, that is caught up in, in crazy town. It's, it's caught up in survival. It's going to go to the news. It's going to go to all of those things. It's, it's like a trap. You don't want to go there, especially when you're trying to sleep. So if we can connect back in and just gently press on your heart and your belly and just go, I'm safe. We're safe and we're connected and draw on that from that calming place it's easy then to allow yourself to go into a restful relaxation or a hypnosis like people said, or a meditation or even journaling after from that place or journaling before and then doing that. Mm, that's wonderful. Well, I'm gonna to go to Bo for a minute. Bo, so many of this has to do with it. even overeating. We talked about this. You talk about reframing obstacles. How would you reframe the situation right now? Yeah, I mean, look, I. I, the way I would reframe it is, look, every time a situation, a situation similar to this has come up, this is, you know, one of a kind, right? 9-11 yeah. was similar. There's, you know, wars that are similar. Uh, somebody close to you that dies. Really catastrophic uh, things like that. I, I wish everyone would do this in those moments. Now I know there's a lot of pain that goes with that and a lot of sorrow and a lot, and a lot of feelings that go with it. But if you look at the situation like, oh, like just, I, I, this is what I've always said. I've said these words. Oh, like when this pandemic came up, when, nine, when the planes hit uh, the building and, and Dawn and I were in New York, um, I said on both those days, both those days that, that this has happened, um, this is what I said. Oh, okay. I know my job. Because the, I see these as gigantic opportunities. I don't know why it may sound crazy to some of you, Back when I played in the NFL, you guys, I had, I grew up in California. So 
when we had to play, when I was in the NFL, when we had to play in nine below zero or 20 below zero, they don't cancel those games, right? Those games are played. I, I'm from California, so I never played in a game like that. But this is what I told myself as I was walking out into the field playing against Cleveland and it's nine below zero on a Christmas Eve. This is what I told myself as I entered the icy field. Ah, oh, okay, good. Lucky for me, I'm a great snow player. I play <laughs> great in the snow. I play, I'm the best player there is when it comes to ice and sleet and crazy ass fans with no shirts on. This is where <laughs> I shine. And that's how I've seen every incident that's ever happened in my life, whether it's tragic or not, I see it as an advantage. And Such I a good note. Such a good note, especially to give your kids too. I mean, that's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really being a leader. It's showing up as a leader and really being yeah. able to inspire yourself and those around you. And it brings me to a question to you, Dr. Lombardo. Um, who is Mitzi? <laughs> Mitzi is my inner critic. Yes, we talked about her in my second TEDx. Um, you know, we all have an inner voice and inner critic. That 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 voice that says you're no good, that says you're a loser, you know, I, I can't believe you just ate that, you're horrible. Um, we all have an inner voice. What's important to realize is you did not come out of your mama's womb with your inner critic. All of that is learned. And anything learned can be unlearned and relearned, whether it's our inner critic or whether it's the habits that we have of this emotional eating. No one came out of their mother's womb doing this. It is learned. And, and I, when I work with clients, I, I do something called neuroregenerative training, which is literally rewiring your brain. So people may be listening to Bo and be like, oh my gosh, he is amazing. And that is the last thing I would be thinking of. That's okay, because with all due respect, Bo did not come out of his mama's womb thinking like that either. He learned that and he has rewired his brain so that becomes his automatic. Everything you're hearing tonight, if you hear, if you hear yourself saying, if you hear your Mitzi, your inner critic saying, I can't do that, I'm stuck like that, that is just learned. Think about the first time you got behind the wheel of a car to drive, right? If you're anything like me, you're like, oh, where do my hands go, right? How much do I turn the steering wheel? How much pressure do I put in the accelerator? As my 15 year old asked the other day, she's learning how to drive. Mom, which one's the brake? So good, good information to have when driving. But anyway, it's awkward and weird and it, it's, it, it's cognitively consuming. Now when you get behind the wheel of a car to drive, you don't even think about it. You're thinking about what songs on the radio. Why? Because you rewired your brain. Emotional eating, it's just your brain wired. Your inner Mitzi, it's your brain wired. And, and, and so you can take these tools and other tools and going with what um, Dr. Jones said in terms of, you know, asking for help, getting the help, getting the training of how to rewire your brain so that you can, and I always say this, you can control your mind instead of letting it control you. Do Dr. Rosenberg, self-affirmations. I know that you're, you're, you're big on that. Can you talk about the science behind this and how they've helped, how they can help someone go through this, this uh, whole problem of, of what we call the quarantine 15? How can, how can that help them? So, so the idea, and I, I, I apologize, I'm, the researchers are not coming to, the mind, to my mind right now. There are a couple of researchers that talked about when you use your name for yourself, and, and then kind of say the thing that you want to, want to have happen, you get a little bit of distance. It's almost like you're guiding, you're providing wisdom to a close friend. And, and so it might be, it might be if, if I were you, Kellyanne, it would, it would be saying, Kellyanne, girl, you got this. You, you can do this. I, Kellyanne, I know that you're afraid, but, but you know what? You've been through hard times before and you can pull yourself through this one too. So it would be using your own name and then saying the direction you want things to go, right? Uh, or to give yourself affirming statements. And, and what they found, and they, I mean, I think I, there was a, I think it was LeBron James that, that speaks to himself when he plays. LeBron, you got this, dude. Scott, you got it, right? So he, there are, and there are many athletes that will do this. The very, uh, competitors will do it. So that there's, there's the reason, again, the research allows, there, it provides a little bit of distance from how we identify ourselves. 
and and there's a quality by which where we when we encourage ourselves in that same way like we would encourage a friend we're able to hear it better so it mm -hmm. might be some of the distance that that dr lombardo is talking about with with mitzi right it's like she's even got a name for the inner critic so she doesn't identify it as elizabeth right <laughs> so so miss right missy somebody else it's not elizabeth right so, so it would be right exactly exactly so it has that same kind of idea a little bit of emotional distance and then and then when we when we make the statement about the direction we want to go it helps us actually go there so, so trisha we, trisha that that's awesome but trisha i want to ask you that this is we've been talking kind of about the mental emotional state of all this but how about tactically you talk about setting kitchen boundaries talk to us about that well, yeah, I mean, what I talk about most is something I, which has helped me over the past 30 years to not have to, you know, go back to 50 pounds overweight. And it's something I call three meal magic. And, and what it really is, is three meals with nothing in between. And this has just helped me to have boundaries around my meals. And so regarding kitchen boundaries, it's, it's just like, you know, I eat, I make sure those meals are really good because I have to, you know, I'm not into diet, like just diet mode. I want to get out of diet mode and just into really self care mode. So making yeah. sure I'm eating really good, nutritious meals. And you teach a lot about that. Um, but then having the meal, you know, make sure I, I sit down and eat it. I put it on a plate. You know, I sit down, I eat it, I enjoy it. I go back to the kitchen, I do the dishes, and then I leave the kitchen. And essentially the kitchen is closed until the next meal time, you know? And especially right now when we're at home staring at all the stockpiled food, you know, and we're at home like all day long, you know? And I, I saw a little meme on, on Facebook that, that said, you know, I'm late, you know, I, I got up late and now I'm, I'm gonna get, I'm, I'm gonna arrive late to my, office or which I'm sorry, I was totally messing it up. But anyway, the point is I'm going to go to my living. I'm late getting in my living room is what the meme said. And so, so the idea that we're just at home with all this food is so hard. And so it's just really the idea that, you know, kitchens open during mealtime and close when it's not mealtime. So wandering in there, opening the refrigerator, you know, 10 times trying to figure out there's something in there that can satisfy us. You know, we just cut down on that when we just realize it's not mealtime. And it's helped me so much when I think I'm hungry, when I have emotional hunger instead of physical hunger. You know, if I can say, gee, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, are you really hungry? Or, you know, or is it emotional? Like, are you afraid to make a phone call? Like, is there something that you're dreading doing? In which case, that's really what it is. Because two hours ago, you just had a really healthy breakfast. And so it just puts boundaries around your meals. And, and it does put boundaries around when you're actually hanging out in the kitchen. Thank you. Melissa, Catherine, how do we avoid um, self-sabotage? Well, first, um, one of the ways, I mean, when it comes to just food or in general? <laughs> well, I think tonight, well, tonight we're talking about the, you know, the quarantine 15, but I think really it's the same, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, first, I always, like I was saying earlier, the first step is awareness we all know the ways in which we sabotage ourselves. If, if we sat down and I said, what way are you getting in the own way of your success? What is stopping you? I guarantee most people would say myself and my mind, right? My beliefs. So we really wanna look at what's getting in the way. And here's the thing with self-sabotage, the mind is set up for survival. So you're always gonna be on a loop. You're gonna, your mind only knows what you've taught it. It only knows how to go as far as you've taught it. So if you've taught it to gain weight and lose weight and gain weight and lose weight, then the minute you lose the weight, you're gonna, it's gonna go, okay, now it's time to gain it again. So this mm -hmm. isn't about having more willpower or discipline. This is about understanding what's going on and why your mind's working that way. And it's not to sit there and go, what's wrong with me? So we don't wanna be, uh, like we don't actually want to sit there and go against ourselves. Instead, we want to be a loving observer and recognize what's going on within our minds and go, okay, so what has the answer? So earlier in the breath work, I, I very much do a lot about connecting back to the body for the innate wisdom of the body. We're animals by nature. Your body always knows the answers. It will always guide you to your ideal weight. It will guide you to when you're hungry. It will tell you where you are deficient in foods. It will tell you what you're really needing at that time. And so that's why those four questions earlier can get you out of any action that you're about to do in self-sabotage. But the other thing that's mainly with that is 
recognizing that and then going, you know, you had asked me earlier about that one bold step. The one thing to get out of self-sabotage is acting in accordance with who you want to be versus who you've been. It's mm -hmm. getting into the identity of who is, who, what do I want? So I, I know that I want to come out of this looking better than ever, right? I want to have a full transformation. People be like, what did you do? Um, so, you know, it's like, okay, well then what actions, what would I need to inhabit? What would be the identity of Kellyanne on the other side? What would be her action step? It's not going to be somebody that's circling the kitchen and eating on autopilot and grabbing her kids' food and not paying attention to her meals and not going for walks and, and working out, right? It would be there would be specific action steps that would align with the identity of the person that doesn't have that level of self-sabotaging cycles going on. So I would really encourage you to look at what, where do you want to be on the other side of this? What are those goals? What would be the action steps that would align to that? And that's the identity. And it's uncomfortable at first because it's not, it's what Bo was talking about earlier as well. It's not who you've been. It is uncomfortable. It takes effort. You have to get out of that comfort zone. And even in our self-sabotaging cycles, there's comfort in our discomfort, which is why we keep defaulting to them. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's really where I would say it would be looking at where you want to go. Be one, being a loving observer, being aware, getting in touch with those four questions of what's really going on in your life right now. What can you do instead? Is that action going to help you or hurt you? What can you do instead? And then taking that bold action step that's in alignment with where you want, really want to be on the other side of this. Mm. That's beautiful. And we said so many amazing things this evening. I hope it's enlightened everyone the, the, the way we, we really set out to do, which is give you the information to set you free, set you free of all these emotions that you may be having that's not serving you in the best interest. We want you to have your best life. So we're going to conclude this, folks. By I want everyone to either to give a best practice, whether it's an app, whether it's a meditation, whether it's a sentiment that you want to pass along, give everyone a parting word that you think that will help them shift them in some way in their life. And please tell everyone where they can find more of you. Start with you, Bo. Yeah, I think the, the one thing that always happens to us in these kind of uh, events is the first thing that we sacrifice and the first thing that we throw out the window is our dream, is our vision. Uh, and we think that that's a luxury and we cannot do that. I think being that you have the time now, I would get very intimate with your dream, very intimate. Instead of being intimate with the news media's dream, what is their dream? Their dream is to keep eyeballs watching them. So you're actually, if you're watching them, you're fulfilling their dreams. I don't think that's what you want to do. I don't think that's what anybody wants to do. Their dreams are about fear-based stuff to scare us so that our eyeballs are on them. Get back to your dream. Get back on your side. Be intimate with you, with your dream. That way, when this thing goes forward, you're out in front of this wave instead of you know, calling a timeout saying, hey, I wish that we had another month of this, you know, stay in place rule that we have, right? You know, we'll be ready to go. So get intimate, get, get, get on your side, have faith in your dream, instead of being intimate with the news media's dream. That's not the dream you want to come true. Yeah. And if, if, good if, statement. If good statement. Me, my name's Bo Eason. BoEason.com is my website. Um, happy to help anybody that, uh, that needs it. And, um, you know, I just want to say, Kellyanne, that this was really cool uh, to do with all these ladies. And I know you really well, and I know Joan really well. But the rest, I, I don't really know uh, very well at all. And I just have to say that, you know, I learned so much. And my wife, Dawn, who you guys know, is over there taking notes on everything you guys get over here, Dawn. Dawn, come out here, please. Oh, come over oh, here. I'm coming out. Okay. Come over real quick. Yeah, come on over. So she's one of she's a very special human Hi. being. Hi. <laughs> so I want the audience to know, former model here. So I want everyone to know the background that you see. I know Dawn. She <laughs> She executed this thing very strategically. The fireplace, it looks great. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> love you both. 
We Thanks. love you both. These are two people who are so committed to um, self-actualizing, not only themselves, but everyone around them. They're very purpose-driven people. So thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Bo. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So the Trisha, so give us a sentiment and tell everyone where they can find you. Uh, I will say that it's not about the food, you know, even though it's, we just always feel like it's, no, I really want that chocolate right now. That's really what I want, but it's really, you know, go deeper. Like it's really not about the food. If we've had, if we've been well fed, if we're taking good care of ourselves, you know, we're hungry for something deeper. And so look beyond that immediate need or assumed need and really go deeper as to what you really are hungry for. And it's there. It's just, we have to spend time doing the work and looking for it, you know? And the other thing is don't try to do it alone. You know, I, I, it's my belief that food is the hardest addiction to overcome because you have to eat three times a day. You have to take the tiger out of the cage, mm. pet the kitty and put it back in three times a day. Yeah. Okay, so don't do that alone. It's too hard. It's too ingrained to have it. I was an overeater since I was three, I think. So really, you know, make sure you get support because together, you know, we can do it much more easily than we can alone. And my website is healyourhunger.com. And so I'm just happy to hear from anybody um, who needs help and extra assistance. Thank you. And thank you thank for the bright light. I really I appreciate your presence. Thanks for having me, Kellyanne. Dr. Lombardo, my dear friend, Dr. Lombardo, who I turn to for happiness because no matter what's in front of this woman, she's always happy. So tell us a last minute sentiment and tell us. You know, it's funny because I, I do focus on happiness and happiness is a mindset. So um, just a little bit about me. Um, my husband, the love of my life, we just, um, we have just passed our my half half life with him. So I've been with him for um, over 25 years. He's been on a ventilator and slowly dying, slowly dying in front of me and our children um, for uh, three years. So, and I, and I share that because I think it's important to realize I, I am happy and it's because I take control of my mind. Are there times when I'm curled up in the corner with snot coming out of my nose crying? Absolutely, right? Because we're human but it's really about your mindset and taking control of your mind. So my parting um, wisdom would be to change your what if to what if. What if to what if, and by that I mean, you know, there's a lot of what if, that's what causes worry. What if I, you know, I um, run out of toilet paper? What if I get sick? What if financially, I, you know, I'm ruined? What if? And when we think like that in that fear-based what if, we emotionally react as if what we're thinking might happen is imminent. And that's where the anxiety comes and that's where the, we get into the red zone and that's when we start to overeat. Change that what if fearful thinking to what if empowerment thinking, right? What if there's a reason for this? That's a positive reason. What if this gives me the opportunity to be closer to my family? What if this, you know, this is finally my opportunity to write that book that's been in me for, you know, decades. What if, and change that, again, that fearful based what if to an empowering what if. Our subconscious will take information, especially questions, and work on it without us realizing it. So make sure you're priming your subconscious with questions where you actually want the answers. Mm. And um, my website is elizabethlombardo.com. Oh, thank you. You know how much I love you. and always thinking about you. Thanks for being here, Dr. Lombardo. Thanks. Dr. Rosenberg, give us a last sentiment, any, any little tip or trick, and uh, please tell us how to get more of you. Okay, thank you so much. Honored to be here as well. And the, I would keep it super simple. There's so many great suggestions. The, and so aligned with much of what's already been said, I would say keep your focus on the vision, not the circumstances and the condition, so that aligns with what Bo just said, and aligned with what Dr. Lombardo just said, it would be to think, speak, and act in the direction you want to go. Mm. Mm. And people can find me at drjoanrosenberg.com or you just punch in my name. You'll see all sorts of lots of things that are associated with what I'm doing. So mm. um, thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Rosenberg. Such a thank pleasure. You. Always a pleasure. Melissa Catherine, hi. Give hi. us the last sentiment or, or anything that you want to add to the conversation and tell us where to find you. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, there's two human emotions, there's love and fear, and we have an opportunity each morning, which one we want to choose. And I think the simplest way when we're getting caught up in our head and in that anxiety 
you are in fear-based thoughts. And that's the quickest way to just go, wait, I'm in my head. I'm not actually in my body. I'm not connected to the truth of what's going on right now. And I'm caught up in, that's the easiest way to really understand when we're in separation and we're not in connection. So love is filled with opportunity, possibility. Everything's working out for me. This is an opportunity for my greatest good. This is an opportunity for me to go higher. This is a gift. And fear-based is what, you know, Dr. Um, Lombardo was talking about with it's fear-based thinking, it's shoulds, it's what ifs, it's future-based. So we want to stay in the present moment and that's going to support you in choosing foods that serve you instead of hurt you and to choose to take time in those moments to identify what's going in going on within you when you're really in that space of love for yourself. Um, and you can learn more about me at melissacatherine.com. MelissaCatherine.com. Thank you, beautiful lady. You can see how beautiful these people are. These are the people that I get to break bread with. How lucky am I? And I hope you felt some of that luck yourself tonight. We're signing out tonight with all the grace and all the love, wishing you a positive path forward. We'll see you next time. Please tune in tomorrow night where we have Doctor's Night Out Deep Dive, where we talk about COVID-19, all the latest with Dr. Vincent Pedre. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye.